Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Malcolm said, my name is Stuart Hennell, and I'm the uh, co-founder and managing director of, of WatchFinder. So what I've been asked to do today is to come and explain to you um, sort of who WatchFinder are, what we've been doing, and what we intend to do going forward. Um, I think the easiest way for me to explain who we are is, is take you on a bit of a journey <coughs> and explain to you what we've done over the last 15 years. It'll give you a, a much more rounded view about you know, the experience we, we've had and, and what's made us into the entity we are today. Uh, I'm able to split this journey into two distinct parts. From um, inception up until 2009, when we had the financial crash, and from 2009 till now. Um, Fundamentally, what we do is very straightforward. Um, we're a C to C proposition. We take watches from members of the public. We uh, service them, we warranty them, we add value, and we sell them back to the public, uh, essentially via our website, but also through our store network in the UK. Um, it's a very simple proposition, but, but often they can be the best. Uh, we, we, we started in 2000. I uh, proved concept and set the, uh, set the company up in 2002. Um, so here's the first part of our journey, um, you know, going back to the early days, we, we were literally a bootstrapped organic startup. Um, I started this in my spare bedroom at home. Um, so in the early days, uh, no experience to fall back on, everything is learning by doing, and you're really trying to find your feet with every decision you make. So the first few years were, were really modifying our, our uh, processes and really finding the best way that we, we could present ourselves to, to our consumers. One of the early wins that you see there is, uh, is our email collection database. So um, I, I would love to tell you that that was um, my insight, but it was, it was purely the fact that we had no marketing budget and this was the easiest way to communicate with our customers. So we were collecting data through our website and communicating on a regular basis. Uh, because we had collected the data ourselves, um, it became very successful very quickly. And even to this day, it's a fundamental component of our sort of um, overall marketing strategy. Um, now, by about 2005, we, we learned a lot about the marketplace we were in. Um, and the most interesting thing we learned was that uh, part exchanges weren't being facilitated in the new watch world. It was obvious to us that to drive more sales, we should be taking watches back much as they do in the car industry. Um, and that's an interesting analogy that I'll probably touch on a few times through this talk. Um, so we really started to think that the new watch world was going to be the most, sorry, the pre-owned watch world was going to be the most interesting space for us to move into. Um, we started investing in our service centre in 2006. Um, and at that time, we were able to exert control over the value-add component of what we were doing. And that's when we realised that actually the future was definitely pre-owned. So, so we moved in that direction. Um, and then we get to 2009, when everything changed. Um, so for the, those of you who were around back then, um, online retail was a, a tricky place to be. Um, uh, the crash was, was difficult. Um, and a few things happened to us, some good, some bad. Um, the good were that consumers changed. So instead of buying watches in a sort of impulsive fashion, what, it became a more considered purchase for, for members of the public. Um, they also, because of the macroeconomic conditions, they were also looking to save some money. Um, so both of those situations threw them in our direction. Um, you know, they went online to do the research and then they found us because we were selling pre-owned watches that were cheaper. So that was a positive. One of the negatives was that um, we were a net importer at that time. And as Sterling crashed, we had to change our um, sort of supply overnight. Um, but we managed to turn that into a positive because we realised that we needed to then buy all our product from the UK. We modified our website and we built the first version of our automated quoting system. Uh, and again, that's one of the most important bits of tech that we rely on today. So the system now, will, will, it doesn't rely on humans, so the emotion is taken out of the process. It's very powerful, very scalable. Okay, this is, this is a better looking graph, isn't it? Um, before I talk about, it's a, it's a bit busy, but before I talk about this, I just want to probably set the scene about the marketplace as it was. 
So back when we started WatchFinder, there, there was no real marketplace per se. It didn't really exist in a meaningful way. Um, so our challenge was, was to do, so, you know, we had to create the marketplace. Uh, we weren't in a position to try and secure market share because the market didn't exist. So what we had to do was go out there and sort of create it from scratch. Um, we tend to forget that sometimes now, where, 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 you know, where we're doing the numbers that we are. Um, but we sat down and thought about it, and we thought, what do we need to do? What we need to do is engender trust. And that's fundamentally in everything we do. Um, you know, it's, it's trust in the company, trust in the service, trust in the product. And if you look at this graph and, and the annotations, a lot of what you see on there is, is about trust. So we created our brand Bible in 2011, and that means the entire company understands you know, exactly what we're trying to achieve. And then from then on, we're, we're creating watch magazines to differentiate us. We're presenting our numbers to our customers so they can feel comfortable in what we're doing. And we started opening stores because you know, that's what consumers need to, to, to feel confident in, in buying expensive items. We massively increased our stock. Um, we acquired accreditations in our service center. And then finally, we're in a position, having demonstrated real fantastic growth for a few years, to secure uh, an investment from Proven. Um, so we were quite proud of ourselves, to be honest. Um, we thought we'd done particularly well. Um, what that led to was um, essentially where we are today. Um, there was a couple of years on there, but their projections, I want to get onto them because they're a bit below where I want them to be. Um, We've now got 160 staff in eight different locations. Um, we're selling, as Karen's alluded to, eight million pounds worth of watches every month. And 95% of those sales are made directly to customers here in the UK. Okay, how are we doing this? Um, again, I'd like to just talk about how we see the future. And I think what we have done historically and what we continue to do is invest our profits into our platforms in order that we can continue to take the business forward aggressively. Um, so it should be fairly obvious, um, uh, we're an online company, we, we need, a, we need a, uh, an IT platform um, that, that's sophisticated and flexible. Um, when we started this project, there just simply wasn't one that you could acquire off the shelf, so we had to build our own. So all the systems we use, both front office, website, sorry, front of house website, back office, are all bespoke systems. Um, they're uniquely designed to accommodate our processes. And you know, we've, we're very proud of it, and they work so well, we're even considering at the minute whether we should license this out, um, because it works so effectively. Just to touch on the website here, uh, some of the highlights of the many things this will do for you, other than make you a cup of coffee in the morning. Automated quoting that I touched on. It will optimise the pricing and optimise publishing tools. Um, secure stock transfer capabilities with dedicated remote audit functionality. With the sort of stock we're now holding, that, that's incredibly important for me personally. And that was me to sleep well at night. Uh, we've got four prudential mechanisms and, and there's a lovely in-store digital presentation solution that, that if any of you have been to one of our stores, you, you, hopefully you'll have seen and used. The second, uh, the second platform is the boutiques. Um, the, the, the company was crying out for, for bricks and mortar. In about 2012, uh, our customers needed the confidence that a store provides, as I've suggested, and we took a long time, really, to get the, 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 the right first boutique. Uh, and we still have that at so the Royal Exchange, but we learned very quickly that this worked incredibly well across the business. Not only were the stores profitable from day one, but the confidence they gave the consumers online was, was uh, it just meant our conversion sort of went through the roof. So that it, it started on the path of sort of stratospheric growth. And we've continued to add them, maybe not as quickly as we'd like, um, but we've actually just secured our Canary Wharf proposition. That's actually opening a little bit earlier. Hopefully we get that open before Christmas. And we're very excited about that. And if that goes to plan, over the next two years, we'll probably be a little more, more aggressive with our, with our store strategy, definitely here in the UK. Service centre. Uh, th this is the big one for me. Um, it is not easy to, to create and grow uh, a service centre. Um, you are beholden upon the Swiss manufacturers. They do not move quickly. Um, and y you can't jump the queue. So this takes a lot of time, 
There was a lot of blood, sweat and tears and a lot of uh, resources, money and a lot of effort gone into this. But now we have what I would consider to be um, a completely unique facility in the UK. Nothing compares to it outside of, of sort of manufacturer provisions. Um, there are approximately 50 plus people working, working in this location. We've secured uh, accreditations, as you can see, for Cartier, Audemars Piguet, Panerai, IWC Amiga. There are more in the pipeline. Um, if any of you are interested or you know anyone's interested, that is worth seeing because it, it impresses me. Uh, the stock. So, interesting thing about the stock, something that we've learned, maybe unique to what we do, and I'm sure you won't read this in any MBA, any books anywhere. Um, in order to provide, uh, to build our brand, provide like a seamless customer service, you have to own the product. You have to ensure um, the availability. You can't rely on someone else supplying. And you have to ensure the quality of the product. Because of our high ba average basket size, people are expecting this to be absolutely immaculate. And if you don't meet those expectations, they're going to send it back. Um, the problems with that is it's very uh, costly, you know, it takes a lot of money. You, you can't sell anything you don't own. You have to buy it, you have to have a value to it if you can sell it. So you can see from there, from 2008, 2016, the increase in the value of our stock, and that's provided its own challenges. Um, but that also aligns itself with the, the growth curve you see, and I think that's had an awful lot to do with it. You know, we know what we're buying, we're buying it properly, um, and it's selling as soon as we buy it. Um, did I miss one there? No? Right, commercial milestones. Again, let's set the scene. Um, when we took the investment, first ball meeting, and I'm glad Karen mentioned the 100 million a couple of times because this was her idea. Um, the objective was to become the de facto marketplace in the UK. Um, it was a five year plan, and to do that, we needed to be three times bigger than our direct com competitor, um, our direct like for like competitor. Um, and the, the number was 100 million. So, off we went. Now, you'll have seen these, these sort of financial charts many times before. Um, I, I, I don't really need to go into it in, in too much detail. I think the key numbers, the key numbers for me and the things that I'm most impressed with are probably over the last three years, um, the growth in the top line. 55%, 54%, 57%. Um, touching on the future, 2017, 2018, these are the numbers at the start of the year. We're just in the process of revising through our six months uh, uh, projections. Um, that's going to go up significantly. So the top line is going to move up from 82.7 to about 92. So we've overperformed well over 10% in that period. And what that will mean is that, that actually it looks like the, the, the growth this year is going to be over 50% as well. Um, I'm really also quite pleased with the, with the EBITDA margin. That was a challenge, maybe when we first talking, started talking to Karen. Um, you know, running at 2%, 3% maybe looks risky. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that this year will be 8, next year 10 plus. So that's where we are with the, with the P&L, and it's moving very much in the right direction. Um, yeah, so the future. Um, I still believe... Um, that we haven't even scratched the surface with this. Um, we have actually, over the last two, two and a half years since we started talking to Karen and Malcolm, haven't done anything different. All we've done is done what we were doing better and bigger. Um, I think that in, uh, in the UK, the UK market, £500 million a year globally. Very difficult number to get um, an accurate gauge on because no one will provide you with, with that number. Um, I think I'm in a position to provide a fairly accurate assessment of that, and that's where we are. Now, if you take the pro rata of the pre-owned and the new sales, I think you're looking at a 13 billion market opportunity globally. No one's looking at it. No one's looking at it. The manufacturers have a silo effect in this respect. They're not looking at second-hand watches at all. They, they see it as um, uh, a competition. They see us as competitors. Um, and that, that's great for me because that means there's, uh, there's going to be a consolidated market at some point, and I think in the near future, uh, and I think we're in the perfect position to, to um, uh, take advantage of that. Um, touching on the car analogy again, 
wouldn't it be weird if you went into a car showroom, bought a new car, and they, they didn't want to know the car you took back in, even if you bought it from them? That'd be a very strange scenario, but that's exactly where we are in the watch industry. I'm convinced it has to change. Economics will dictate that that has to change. Uh, I think watch finery is the perfect structural solution to, to the primary sector. I think as you have this, this situation where the new watch world is sort of engaging with the internet, understanding that their old school distribution networks don't really work anymore, and they can start retailing because that maximizes the margin, they're then going to stand, understand that there are other sort of structural solutions that they need in place. And the underwriting of the product is something that we do extremely well. Um, International expansion. It shouldn't be lost on, on any of you that the products we buy and sell are the same here, they're the same in Europe, they're the same in the States, they're, they're the same everywhere. Um, they're almost a commodity in, in that respect. As soon as we're in a position, or as soon as we decide to go into a new territory, we will be at least three to five times bigger than our nearest competitor. And we will have everything that we need to compete aggressively from day one. Um, you know, simple maths dictate that if in, say, three years we can go into five new territories and only generate 20% of what we're doing in the UK without any growth here in the UK, which would be unusual, we're doubling our throughput. So, so the opportunities for continued growth are, are replete. Um, should have put Prove in there. Um, I think, that, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. The, the relationship has been fantastic. Um, I, th I think we had taken the company to, uh, to a point where we needed the investment and it's worked extremely well for Watchfinder. Um, I think that one of the, ex one of the unexpected benefits um, of having a professional investor like Proven has been the way that other organisations have uh, sort of looked and dealt with Watchfinder. Post-investment... Post post um, it's as if we matured with the investment and people just start to deal with us very, very differently. It's been incredibly beneficial, you know, obviously from banks, but from solicitors and accountants, all of a sudden you, you have many more options that you could um, utilise. Um, I think for me personally, I've um, respected the people who are now sitting on my board. I think it's been excellent for me. They've given me guidance and counsel. Um, but as much as anything, I've been able to use them as a touchstone for any ideas or concerns we have. And really, their light touch has been invaluable in giving me and the other founders the confidence to continue doing exactly what we've been doing to get us to where, where we are now. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I look forward to the future with Proven. And if any of you guys have got any questions, I'll, I'll happily answer them.